Good afternoon. Welcome to the second of four Sunday Salons of the 2022 season. I'm Lisa Fox Martin, the chair of the Board of Trustees. And on behalf of all of our, our trustees, I welcome you uh, and thank you for joining us. Uh, for a very, very special and very unusual Sunday Salon. Uh, Betsy Jacks will now introduce to, to us uh, our speakers for today, and I'm sure we'll all really uh, enjoy this uh, very, very unusual presentation. Uh, so thank you for coming. Uh, over to you, Betsy. Thanks, Lisa, our wonderful chair of the Board of Trustees. I'm Betsy Jacks, the Executive Director, and I'm so pleased to welcome today Pippa Biddle and Ben Davidson. They are the owners of Quitner Antiques in Germantown since 2018, which is just across the river from the Thomas Cole site here in the Hudson Valley. And they have also been writing this wonderful feature for the magazine Antiques called Object Lessons. And they take an object and they delve into the human story behind it, um, doing a fantastic job of bringing in new fans for old things. Um, so we here are fans of old things and the stories they tell. So I'm so thrilled to hear from them today. They have been delving into a couple of Thomas Cole objects and uh, looking at every little detail um, and telling us what they mean and what they could have uh, meant in, to Thomas Cole. So we're, we're so excited to hear what they have to say. Um, and afterwards, we will have the chance to ask questions. So as you think of a question along the way, you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and go ahead and just type in your question and I'll uh, refer to that list at the end. So please uh, enjoy the talk now with Ben and Pippa. Thank you so much, Betsy, for having us. Um, I am going to share my screen so that you guys can see our PowerPoint. Um, there we go. You should be able to see that. Um, and if it isn't working, just let me know. Uh, my name is Pippa Biddle. This is Ben Davidson. And we, as Betsy said, run Quitner in Germantown and write a column for the magazine Antiques and are really excited here today to talk about Thomas Cole's traveling trunk along with a couple other things. Um, the tagline uh, for our talk today is uh, special because it's not, which uh, may in fact be the tagline for a lot of what we do. Uh, when it comes to object lessons. So we started the object lesson column in 2019 for the magazine um, because Greg Serio, the, the editor-in-chief of the magazine, walked into our store and asked a pretty brief question that clearly he did not expect a full answer to. And we gave him like 30 minutes of uh, downloading on, I think that one was on Fractor. Oh, yeah, the type, the um, German font type. Yeah, and it was a lot of fun, and we were able to leverage that into convincing him to let us do that in the pages of the magazine. And so we've written about Conic Baskets, uh, the pottery of Lucy M. Lewis, uh, made of Amorik Fuller, the African-American sculptor, uh, the willow pattern. So everything from things that are quite elevated to quite, um, I'd consider the willow pattern semi-mundane, would you? Yes. Yeah, so uh, the point of an object lesson really just to sort of give us a shared framework of understanding as we dive into the traveling trunk um, and into Thomas Cole's life is to peer into history through material culture. Sometimes that's elevated. Sometimes it is a piece of artwork. Sometimes it's something that is um, sort of objectively seen as valuable and valued. Uh, and sometimes it's something mundane and overlooked. And I think the mundaneness and the things that are overlooked are often actually the most interesting and the ones that can provide us with the most cultural context for a person and a time and a life. Um, and so that is how we landed on the traveling trunk. And for us, it was really exciting when Thomas Cole reached out to us um, and said, hey, would you be willing to, to look at a piece in our collection? And thank you for moving that. And uh, 
do an object lesson on it. And we sort of bounced around a couple of different ideas for what the object could be. And when the traveling trunk was suggested, it immediately clicked for us because this is precisely the type of object that we get most excited about. There's been very, very little research done on it. Um, it is beat up and overlooked and often, um, I'm sure it's been used to rest feet on more than people have paused to really like examine it, uh, which is not at all a knock to the Thomas Cole House, but just the reality of these objects. Uh, they are the things that are not the art. They are the ephemera that surrounds it. Um, and just to give you a sense of size, it's nice, it's sort of ne next to a bed here, which gives a little bit of sense of scale. But if you imagine a traveling trunk, it is that size. It is the size of a traveling trunk. Yes, it's it's kind of a, a standard coffer size. Um, <laughs> but you can do materials. Yeah, I can do materials. Um, uh, so it's um it's been it's made of wood, leather, metal in the studs and plating and hardware, um, and then it's uh it's been lined in a in a paper on the inside. Um, so it's fairly utilitarian and with very slight decorative flourishes. Yeah, and what can be seen here is actually the collection number. So that is not just to clarify a period detail, that is that they know what it is in the Thomas Cole collection. Um, and then it also has a paper lining, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. And these objects are not uh, period. Are, yeah. yeah. Uh, Cole didn't put them in. No, yeah. they, are, they are added by the, the team to sort of show what might be in a traveling trunk, which is accurate. It would have clothing, it'd have books. Um, and some other stuff that we're excited to dive into. Uh, but before that, we want to take a look at the lid. And so the inside of the lid has this paper label, John Wilson, saddle harness and saddle harness collar and trunk maker, um, number 341 Pearl Street near Franklin Bank. Uh, and what I really love is the wording of these types of labels. So I'm just going to read it for anyone who can't uh, make it out on the screen keeps on hand and makes to order all articles in the line of his profession of a superior quality and will be thankful for the patronage of the public and his friends. Trunks of every size and description can be furnished at the shortest notice. A good supply is generally kept on hand, ready finished to accommodate customers. New York, October 1827. So when Cole was 20, 26 years old because he was born in yeah. 1801. And um, so the trunk was most likely purchased between the fall of 1827. And when Cole left for his first trip to back to Europe, back, because um, he, of course, was an immigrant to this country uh, in 1829. And the history, a little bit of the history of the maker, there were just countless makers like this John Wilson in New York City at the time. Um, but we do know that he was listed at the Pearl Street address in the New York City directory in 1848 and 1842. So he was at that address for about 20 years, at least. Um, and then in 1850, his address had changed to 135 Bowery near Grand Street. Now, at that time, he also changed his wording a little bit for what he did. He changed it to a general assortment of coach, gig, wagon, and cart harness, always on hand, fireman's caps and military equipment, packing trunks, supplies to merchants and others. And the language of these ads really speaks to decent but not fine craftsmanship, which the trunk excel mm -hmm. itself sort of exhibits. Um, he was a general leather goods manufacturer. He's the kind of guy, a 20-something year old man without a lot of money who needed a box to put his stuff in to travel across the ocean would go to um, to pick a piece out. And, and a lot of the facts that he's doing so many different things, he has them on hand, they're not being custom made to order, um, really speaks to that. Uh, and that he's doing things like fireman's caps yeah. along with these trunks. Um, the tooling that we can see on them, which is in this slide here, was also probably an existing design to the piece when Thomas Cole picked it. Um, something that he sort of put on different trunks, had different designs, hey, you can pick it out, but it's not specialty for Thomas Cole, um, which if you want to yeah, jump. It, it, it would have been kind of, it 
most likely it's an off the rack model. Um, one that was made and then someone walked in and said, I need a trunk, I'm going to Europe. And they're like, oh, we have this one available. Um, and uh, it's so the finishing would have like, perhaps the, the um, uh, tooling was, was done at that point, but most likely it was done before the leather was attached to the trunk. Mm -hmm. um, and Which the, also explains some of the details that we can see in yeah, a later yeah. slide. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and the stud work like with the initials would have been done custom, but it's, um, it's not at all a, a high prestige item. Yeah, and so inside of the trunk, we do have Thomas Cole's signature and 1829. So it's likely he bought it closer to when he was leaving for Europe in 1829 than when that label was affixed or printed at least in 1827. Um, and you're gonna talk a little bit about the wonderful detail here on the front. Yeah, so um, Thomas Cole's initials are on the front of the trunk. Uh, they're obviously brass. Um, studs that are um that are hammered in um so they look to us like one might read them as a fairly high status symbol because it's like monogrammed and it's very um you know fancy to have things monogrammed today um but at the time this was fairly typical of a middle kind of a middle class or middle range item it really what it indicates is not that he's wealthy enough to have his initials put on something but rather that he is poor enough to have to travel in a way where his bags could be mixed up with other people's. So, you know, in our day of, you know, of flying in, you know, large airplanes, we all more or less travel together. But at this time, you could purchase or have ready made for you a, a carriage that would take you around Europe. If you're traveling in mixed company or in a mixed carriage, then you're going the budget way. And so that's really what this indicates is he it, it it even looks a little bit like it's fairly roughly done. Um, like the T has serifs, but the C doesn't. And so it, it kind of looks like it was done. This is obviously my, my gloss or my interpretation, but looks like it was done after market. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, it's kind of like, okay, I've lost this thing too many times. There are too many brown trunks that look just like, and I, I, I want to put my initials on it so that I can say like, it's the one with TC on it. Yeah, just hand that to me. Oh, okay, I'll take it. Which also explains why it's off center yeah. and why it doesn't match up with the embossing. Exactly. Because if this was something where the trunk was made knowing that these initials yeah. would be on it, that all be centered, it all be lined up. But this is very much sort of a uh, roughshod layering yeah. of different things on top of each other. Um, and so it, this is in st really the contrast rather than today's monogramming that we should keep it in mind or keep in mind is this compared to say someone who's wealthy enough to be titled or have a coat of arms where then that would be painted onto or, or incised into the trunk. And it's having a coat of arms or having being um, wealthy enough to have kind of a representation like that is sort of the TSA pre-check of its time where it's, it's very much like, oh, he's a baron, so I trust him. You know, when you're going across borders or you're being stopped at, at a border patrol or, um, or at a, a checkpoint or something. Um, whereas this is, this is not that high pollute. It's, it's very work a day. Yeah, it's special because it's not. Yeah, exactly. One hundred percent. So we, as we were examining the trunk in the collection, noticed something that really excited us, um, and we hope you find it exciting as well. And there are these little shreds of fabric that are nailed into the sides of the lid. And uh, why, you may ask, are you excited by shredded fabric? Well. Uh, it's because our theory on these is that these are straps used to um, affix something so that he could store something in the lid. So the lid is quite deep. Uh, it's about four inches deep. And that'd be a lot of empty space to waste when this is, you're carrying your entire life for a year or more uh, in this standard size traveling trunk. And so why in the world would you allow there to be four inches deep by two and a half, three feet long of dead space. And so what most likely these were, were the straps that went across. Um, now, if he was packing standard to the time, uh, what he'd be putting in the top would be hard goods uh, that aren't too heavy, um, but that he needs to access frequently, which we would estimate would most likely be his painting supplies. So it might be, yeah, yeah, paper, paper canvas. canvas. I mean, he was doing a lot of sketches. He yeah. was, as we'll remark on later, uh, collecting botanicals. Um, 
the a, a, a folding easel, something that just allowed him to put the the stuff that he had his work items in the lid of this trunk. Now it also makes sense that they'd be shredded now because this trunk was used very heavily. Um, it went, we believe, on two trips with him to Europe. There were multi-year trips. Yeah, that were multi-year trips. And it would make sense that uh, perhaps one of the reasons it had to finally be retired uh, was that it got shredded in the process. Um, and again, this is just a theory of ours based on these scraps and, and where they are in the trunk. Um, but it does fit the use. It fits the time. It fits uh, parallel pieces. Um, and it fits Thomas Cole. And it makes us really excited. Uh, but I think it's important to also situate this trunk in specifically where he was going and what he was doing. Yeah, I mean, as those strips, the the straps show us, he he wasn't traveling for pleasure. It was it was very much a, a work trip, and um and it's kind of uh, I feel it's important to kind of have a scope of what that entails, what that um what those trips were, and so this is a depiction of uh, Regency. Um, uh, coach. So, so it's, it's a, a bit it's, earlier. It's a little earlier, about 10 years or so, but um, but it kind of gives the idea. You can see the, the bag strapped to the top. Um, you can see quite a few people are, are piled on. Um, I but, think it for us, we were looking for an image to depict discomfort. Yeah. And to us, this is like a very elegant discomfort. Yeah. Um, so in uh, Thomas Cole traveled to Europe between 1829 and 1832. This is his first trip. Um, he was our age, which is pretty cool. Yeah, don't know that. Well, I'm 29, he's yeah. 30, he was 28. Yeah. So we're contemporaries. So we're Thomas Cole. <laughs> um, no, so he traveled to Britain um, and I'm just gonna do a quick run through of where he went. So he traveled from New York to Britain, then um, uh, traveled to Paris in 1831 um, from London. Uh, then uh, he went from, Paris to Italy, where he traveled via Vettura, which is a four-wheeled kind of hackney coach or, or a, um, a, a carriage, rented. A rent, yeah, a rented carriage that um, that you, one could travel in alone, but most likely he, for several of his trips, he split the, the cost with, with others to travel um, a little more, uh, less expensively. Um, and Economically. So, yes, thank you. Uh, and then he, um, traveled around uh, Italy through 1832 until November 1832 when he arrived back in New York. Um, well, he arrived in October. Wait. He left Italy in yeah, October. Yeah, he, he arrived in November. In Thank yeah. you. Thank you. <laughs> and then he was here for 10 years. And something that's important is that this trip to Europe, as we mentioned, was not a leisure trip. It was paid for by commissions. And he had work to do when he got home. Um, he had paintings, literal paintings that he had to do that were based on these commissions. And then 10 years later, he'd saved up the money and gotten the commissions to do this again and to do another big trip. Um, and so, and that's him sort of in the meantime, that's in 1836, I believe. Yeah. I can be corrected so. by Betsy and her team, but I believe it's an 1836 self-portrait. Uh, so that's sort of Thomas Cole in the midst of this period. And then in 1841, Oh, hold on. Uh, in, I'll be back in a sec. In 1841, um, he traveled on the Great Western, um, to which was at the time the largest uh, steam paddle boat um, in the world, and it was built specifically to do the Atlantic crossing. So that sounds quite impressive. Uh, it was assuredly not comfortable. And so he took the Great Western, uh, leaving on uh, August 7th and arrives in London on the 21st. So that's quite a long crossing, um, although much faster than it had been years before. And um, he then traveled through Northern England, visiting Kenilworth, which we're gonna talk about a fair bit, uh, Warwick Castle, Stratford-upon-Avon. Uh, Avon, he sees his family in Derbyshire and Lancashire. Um, he went to Paris on October 6th and perused the Louvre approvingly, uh, which he had recounted in his journal at the time, and which is actually really important. We'll remark a little bit more about it, but the idea of collecting works of art in one place uh, almost made some of these trips not as important. You didn't have to travel around the world to see things. You could just go to one spot. Uh, he went to Rome by way of Switzerland, and he spent time in Rome 
creating a copy of, this is one of the images of the Voyage of Life uh, for exhibition in Rome, which is another thing that he and artists like him often do is create copies of their work because they couldn't have one piece in more than one place at a time. Um, fortunately, they did not have the internet yet. <laughs> so they couldn't just look something up. They had to see it in person. Um, the, he then traveled to Southern Italy uh, and then eventually made his way back in 1842 uh, with a lot of work to complete. Um, yeah, so he, um, so why list the itineraries, which we've just finished doing? It, I think that it's important to, to recall that the travels that he's going through by sea and land are very difficult. They're not, they're, they're not, they're not just driving down the highway. And it's important to remember the, the amount of effort and difficulties that it was to travel. I mean, he travels to Rome from France via Switzerland. Switzerland hadn't yet created the large highways that now cross the Alps. They were still on the old mountain passes that have made them such treacherous mountains for so long. Like these are not easy things to do, but he pursued them in, in the hopes of seeing the natural world in a way that would influence his art. Um, and it's, it's just important to, to realize how, um, I mean, Pippa mentioned the, the Louvre and kind of concentrating art in one place that the reason that the Louvre was filled with so much largely Italian art by Napoleon was well, one, imperialism, but two, because Napoleon believed that up until then people had to travel to these tiny out of the way towns or cities in Italy to see, you know, Renaissance art or masterpieces. And the idea was that if you bring them all into one place, it, it becomes easier for, for everyone so that they don't have to have the ability to afford traveling to tiny little mountain villages. They can instead go to one place and see all of the great art. Um, and so Thomas Cole, to a certain degree, is, is a maverick and that he's still doing all of the traveling to all of these little places. But, um, but he, you know, he wanted to, to climb was it uh, Vesuvius or what? Edna. Yeah, was it Edna? He wanted to climb out and see the sun. It's like, okay, well, you're a romantic. That's fine. Um, but but it's just a it's an it's an interesting thing that he's kind of at this juncture where it's still incredibly difficult to travel, um, but he does it anyway. Uh, so what's this place? So this is Kenilworth Speaking Castle as it is today. Um, Kenilworth Castle is one of the most important medieval surviving castles, uh, surviving castle ruins in Britain. Um, it's, it was very much the second castle in the kingdom to Windsor, um, which is the, the Royal Palace of Windsor. Um, Kenilworth was built during the Norman Conquest, uh, or shortly after the Norman Conquest. Um, it was then massively expanded in the 12th and 14th century, uh, centuries, uh, and then was largely um, updated during the Tudor period. It became a royal castle uh, in the late 14th century, early 15th century, and it's, it was for example, Queen Elizabeth's favorite palace or one of her favorite palaces. Um, and it's it's a massive ruin. If anyone, if one travels there today, you can see it's a huge, it, it is in fact a huge medieval palace. Um, that's a very uh, overwhelming structure. And it's somewhere that really caught Thomas Cole's not just attention, but imagination. Yeah. yeah. And so he visited it in uh, 1841. He, had, um, he traveled to England with a commission uh, to paint for Thomas Fail, who was a philanthropist, banker, and art collector at the time. And um, Fail actually wanted him to do an Italian scene. And Cole was like, no, 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 I'm going to paint Kenilworth and that'll be great, just trust me. And so he painted Kenilworth Castle and a Swiss and a, um, a Swiss scene um, for Fail, but he traveled there to get, uh, to do these sketches. And so he, this is an aide de memoir, he, he sketched for his painting. Um, and, uh, and he was really enraptured with the place. He describes it in incredibly flowery language to, in letters to his wife. And it clearly um, moved him. Uh, and, um, and, he was, and obviously it's a, it's a large scale ruin. And so Thomas Cole is the master of painting ruins and, um, and it clearly uh, in, enraptured him. Well, I think an important thing that you brought up as well is that the painting that was produced for Fail is yeah, now missing, it's, it's correct? Missing. So the, the painting was in Fail's collection um, in as late as March, 1872, when it was exhibited at the Brooklyn Art Association's first chronological exhibition of American art. And it was photographed <laughs> there. So there is a surviving photograph of the painting, but it has since been lost. Um, yeah. Yeah, which is tragic. Yeah. 
But so but that's also true of so many of Cole's paintings. Yes, yeah. But one of the reasons that Kenilworth was interesting to us as we were looking at the trunk, because you might be like, what does yeah. this have to do with the trunk other than he had it with him, was another object in the Thomas Cole collection, um, which is uh, this botanical sample, which Thomas Cole actually took from Kenilworth during that 1841 trip. And to us, it shows an example of what the trunk could serve for him as a purpose. I mean, he didn't have a lot of money. He had to be really economical. He couldn't just carry tons of stuff with him. He had this one trunk. And so something that he could take with him as a souvenir, as inspiration, as memory, were botanical samples. And so this is something that he was able to do because of the trunk, because it kept them safe. Um, but it also didn't take up very much space. Um, and so to us, that does sort of provides another layer of context and understanding for how Cole um, engaged with this piece, the trunk in his life, how he engaged with the places he was going, um, and what purpose it served for him. Um, so this is Thomas Cole uh, in 1845, I believe. Uh, two years after returning from Europe in 1842, Cole took on church as a student. He dies in 1848 at 47 years old. So he dies only seven years after being at Kenilworth and collecting those botanicals. Um, it's such a small window of time in which to create work. Um, and yet such amazing work was done. And I think that's another reason why so many of us are fascinated by him is um, the reality of, of the grandeur of what he created, but also the potential of what could have come. Um, and uh, on the flip side of that, it's I think that the really interesting about the trunk and, um, and kind of the botanicals as well is the way that it speaks to Thomas Cole as a, as a person. Um, as like an everyday or an average person, because we so often get wrapped up in kind of these great man narratives where like he's an artistic genius and seeing that he, you know, had to get a budget trunk or that, you know, he tucked some flowers into a book or what have you to, to press them to remember a place. It's just a very telling and touching little like personal moment. Um, and it's and I think it's really important to to understand kind of the towering figures in history, at, both for what they did, but also for what they were. Um, you know, we think of the founding fathers as kind of titans, um, but we don't always remember that John Adams and Benjamin Franklin, as old men as serving ambassadors in Paris, squabbled over whether to leave the window open when they were sleeping at night. You know, the, like Abraham Lincoln was obviously Abraham Lincoln, but he also, as a young lawyer, traveled the circuit and slept like six people to a bed. And it's that kind of the discomfort of the travel and the, and the really human moments that we sometimes forget or gloss over and that really have to be kept in mind in order to not lose the person in their, their mystique or their myth. Yeah, I think something that when we were putting this together that you said that I really loved, um, so I have it in our notes, was grounds our understanding of the grand personas that today can feel unmoored from the itchy mattresses and bumpy roads of their time. And I think that is such an important thing to reflect on. And it's why pieces like the traveling trunk are so important to have is looking at this daguerreotype um, of Cole, he's, he's quite regal and elegant and it's easy to imagine him living a life that we see in period films, which are notoriously uh, creative <laughs> um, and and it's it's easy to forget um the everyday inconveniences i mean it's easy to forget what it's like to not have indoor plumbing it's easy to forget what it's like to not be able to just go sit on a train i think that one of the things the pandemic has done for us is remind us of sort of how some so many of these things that are now modern day conveniences are in fact conveniences not necessary to survive um but having more daily reminders of that, I find to be a really valuable thing. Um, something that also really struck us when we were talking with the team at Thomas Cole about the trunk and about Cole's life um, was just the reminder that he wanted to be a wealthy man and he wanted the accoutrement of being high class, but he never reached that status. Uh, we have written records of him bemoaning that, um, 
I can't, Betsy's gonna have to correct me about that. Like the blacksmith the, the or the butcher, butcher. Yeah. A carriage and I have to walk to town. Or a horse yeah. and I have to walk yeah, to town. Yeah. Like it's, he, he really yeah. struggled, not just financially, but also mentally with what it meant for him to be an artist um, and to be someone who was uh, in some ways lauded, but also to not be wealthy. And the trunk is a really good grounding reminder of that, of just the basics of his life and the humble realities. Um, I'm sure he'd been, be a little chagrined about us talking about it this way, but you know, it's the reality. Yeah, hundred um, percent. And you know, it's it's similarly he. You know, it helps to illustrate how much travel and how much European influences really helped to create um, Cole, because his his education began with mesotents that he saw while. A young man in England and his education was shaped by the public collections and the museums that he was able to visit and his milieu was an international one and he, there are you know so often we try to claim him as a purely and unadulteratedly American personage and that just wasn't the case he was a European artist as much as he was an American yeah 100 percent so as we sort of start to wrap up on this, um, we have to ask ourselves again, what use is an old box? And hopefully at this point uh, to you listening, um, that doesn't seem to be a crazy question. Uh, the purpose of the box is it tells us stories, um, not because it can talk or even because there are, are things held within it, but because it provides the context necessary to illustrate a whole life. And Cole was an adventurous and hardworking artist uh, and was striving for a status in society that into which he was not born. Um, the trunk underlines all of this and it's a utilitarian reminder of, um, of the hard work he did and the hard life that was on the road and at sea. Mm -hmm. um, even coming up to the Catskills from New York City at the time was far more difficult than than today. It was seven hours by steamboat and then and then another four hours by stagecoach to get to the Mountain House, which was a hotel that was frequented in the Catskills. Mm -hmm. And that's I mean that's eleven hours to get from the city to Catskill. And it's not eleven hours on a cushy train. No, it's eleven <laughs> hours by steamboat, which is at least nice, and then carriage over over mountain roads. Yeah. Um, and that's that's not an easy thing. And but he did it willingly and and regularly to to see kind of nature and its wonder. Yeah, a quote that really guided us in our exploration of uh, this piece for the collection um, or from the collection is uh, from poet William Cullen Bryant from his funeral oration for Cole at the Church of the Messiah in New York City in 1848. And he said, the contemplation of his works made men better. They were the sincere communications of his own moral and intellectual being. And that's, I mean, I think that we can leave it at that. What else is there to say? No, I think there's, there's this, there's last thought. I really like, there is something, we were reflecting on this in bed since something I loved. Yeah, and so, so I wanted to finish okay. with it. So I, I was thinking on what it means to, to we had the opportunity to handle his trunk. And um, I wrote that um, it's an odd sensation of mutual contact, that this object had been in, in his hand, that his hand touched this thing and now our hands do as well. And that that's a direct connection that's, that's personal more than anything else. Thank you. Yeah. So as we close up again, uh, we write a column for the magazine Antiques called Object Lesson, where we do this with lots of other objects. Um, for the March, April issue, we look at the art of Napoleonic prisoners of war. Ships of bone and hair, I'm proud of the title. Yeah, <laughs> ships of bone and hair, which yeah. were literally made of mud and bones and human hair. Um, and we just wanna say thank you to the team at Thomas Cole for having us, to Betsy, Lisa, Heather C, Heather P, um, and to Jen uh, for bringing us in. And with that, we're gonna stop sharing our screen and we'd love to do some questions. Hey guys, thank you so much. That was, that was awesome. I'm gonna pull up the Q and A window and anybody who would like to ask a question, if you move your mouse a little bit, if you're on a, on a desktop, at least that will work, bringing up the Q and A taskbar at the bottom and click on that, type in your question. So I've got a couple already here. Um, and, but before 
I dive into those, I want to just say thank you because what you guys have just laid out so perfectly encapsulates what we're doing um, at historic sites and why they're different than a white box art museum. You know, so what I think we can provide that's so different is the depth behind all the artwork, the depth behind the person, why they made the artwork. I mean, you, you look at the art in a completely different way once you know the person who's made it. And of course that's relevant. Of course, the whole context is relevant. Um, these little details that you've brought out about his, his, his uh, consciousness of class status, it was huge for him and, and really plays into his art. So perfect. I mean, I just, I just really love that you brought that out. So thank you. Um, so I have some questions here. So first off, um, oh, well, see, now this was just exactly what I was going to say myself. So can you tell us why it is important to study the objects and their history? Often the world of antiques and antique sales revolve around objects of white male individuals of class. How can this world be of aid to studying a wider and more inclusive history? So a hundred percent. Uh, antiques and the decorative arts field is heavily driven by men historically, and that has, um, and particularly white men, and that has absolutely, um, literally color what gets looked at and what gets seen. And to us, it's not a matter of um, turning the light necessarily from one thing to another, but rather broadening the scope of the spotlight and bringing more people and more objects into it. So one of the big things for us with our column has been being really conscious about making sure that we're focusing on the work of indigenous people, of people of color, um, and, and doing that not by accident, but again, in a really conscious and thoughtful way. And kind of showing so often our column focuses on um, kind of the, the almost made it antique like the person who who was just as good as the person who did have the the you know amazing career or what have you but for one reason or another it just didn't quite pan out um and so i think that that's a a, a, a focus of ours is kind of seeing where why history or the story kind of turned or or what knew that so and so or such a person wasn't allowed to to showcase you know on the same scale yeah a hundred percent and and again it's not it's not about ignoring one figure from the past to focus on another. Instead, it's broadening the conversation, bringing more people into it, providing deeper context. The more people we can highlight, the more relationships we can show, the broader web we can weave and illuminate. I think one of the things that I love about um, places like the Thomas Cole House is the opportunity to use the physical location as a contextualizing force um, and as something that uh, really can illuminate so many, so many people beyond just the man whose name is on it. And I think that's something that we all can work on in the industry and continue to sort of challenge ourselves on is how many more people can we bring into that conversation and can we illuminate using these places that are so beautiful and so special. It also speaks to the value of material culture as a means of, of studying these objects because it is, there are things that we constantly discover in kind of otherwise overlooked objects or things that are forgotten because it shows like, oh, actually this this, you know, material came from this place or the, you know, it actually was owned by others or what have you, where um, things that aren't, you know, the painting of George Washington or something can reveal a story that otherwise has been overlooked to up till now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and um, again, that's really the great advantage of a historic site is that it has a whole microcosm of America in it, you know, has all levels of society interacting there, all races and genders. And so we have the opportunity to show the context behind the art in a way that I think a, it's it's harder in a, in a white box space. And so we have a initiative we call Full House. It's mm -hmm. a little known fact that the house actually had about 14 people living in it. And that's not including visitors and all kinds of people who came into work. And so it's a, it's a big community and we're, researching it and it's fascinating all the people that made it possible for Thomas Cole to create his art. So um, yeah, it, and these objects tell that story. Somebody made it, somebody carried it, you know, just all the people that come into the objects come out when you talk about them. Um, so I, I have a question too, which is um, 
I wanted to know how you guys know so much about old stuff. Like how, you know, like, <laughs> you, like how did you learn, you know, all these little bits of history and, you know, to look at the labels and to look at the materials and you know, just where did this, uh, I guess, all this education of yours come from? <laughs> I think one is that we both grew up around a lot of it. So in different situations, my family has lived in the same house since 1760 um, mm -hmm. in Dover, Delaware, called the Ridgely House. It's where my mom grew up. It's where my grandmother lives now. Um, and it was, there's, there are many things in the house that have been there for a very, very long time. And when you, what I find is when you grow up surrounded by objects such as that, you either repulse them and <laughs> try to get them as far away from you as possible, or you become obsessed with them. And for me, I'm very lucky that it was the latter. Um, I think both Ben and I are researchers at heart. I worked professionally as a writer before we started Quitner. Um, and Ben spent time studying at Oxford and really immersing himself in history through that lens. And he can say a bit more about that. But both of us want to know the story behind the things that we encounter. Now, does it often take up more of our time than we should spend? Like, Who's researching to, who's every to <laughs> yeah. who's to say <laughs> who's to judge <laughs> but but it is for us like that is the whole point of what we do is to understand yes we buy and sell predominantly old things but it isn't the aspect like retail didn't get us into retail it's history that got us into retail um and that's that's really where our love for it lies he's also he's also an absolute encyclopedia so <laughs> i feel like an imposter all the time because i get to mooch on his expertise ben's brain holds uh facts <laughs> uh his father may be on this as a kid his father had him like copy quotations down and so his brain can just hold information that blows my mind i wish i had that <laughs> so do i i do <laughs> um Okay, so the next question actually was, again, something we were just talking about. So um, do you have any research on the laborers who had carried the trunk, making the travel possible? I mean, like, so I was thinking about that. Like today we have suitcases that roll, you know, because we have to carry them ourselves. And, you know, the idea of trying to transport this giant leather box, you know, obviously there are people carrying it. Um, so yeah, do you know anything about that? So this is a tough one to answer without, or to, to kind of a tough, topic to research without getting really into minutia. The way that one would discover personages who, you know, were, were equivalent of like bellhops or porters or something to, to help along with travel is to get into registers or receipts of payment at various, like at a boarding house or at, at a, you know, a station or what have you, which can be done. Where those records exist, like you can find the people and you could figure out who was working in the month when he visited, et cetera, and you could, you could track it down. It's and if we were writing a biography of Thomas Kohler or focused on that, then then that would be kind of front and center of research yeah. because that that is the real story. It's kind of the, I mean, it's a very upstairs, downstairs kind of a, a look at things, but it's like, that's how, you know, it's like a duck on water. Like that's how things actually move. It's the ferocious paddling. Yeah. Well, and I think an important thing to note at risk of like stumbling over my words a little bit, um, it was not, when... <laughs> When people envision, especially in people in the United States, envision who would have been doing the manual labor, there's often a very, in this period, which is pre-emancipation, um, there's often a very uh, particular image that comes to people's minds, which is enslaved people carrying and doing the manual labor, which in some situations was the case. However, for a lot of the places that Thomas Cole was traveling, there was something a bit closer to a um, like Sherpa status, uh, which we Porters, see, right. yeah, where it's it's families that for years have been yeah. doing porter work. Um, it doesn't mean it was it, it, that they were paid well. It doesn't mean that they were highly respected necessarily. It doesn't mean that someone said thank you to them. However, it was uh, a really like legitimate it was, enterprise. It was closer to a closed guild system than yeah. to one of kind of crushing uh, or, you know, uh, despotic uh, employment or enslavement, where it was, you know, you had a duty, like one had a mm -hmm. duty and they've done it for forever. And so especially like traveling through Switzerland, it's going to be Swiss people who are helping it. 
or, or French yeah. people. Well, and even if we look at the, the travels of um, Thomas Cook, so I'm a little bit obsessed with Thomas Cook, who was like one of the pioneers of global tourism um, and parallel to Thomas Cole's trips was creating the first like package trips for middle class, um, predominantly uh, British individuals uh, to travel around the world. So he was taking people to, um, to Europe, he was taking people to the Middle East, what's now known as the Middle East. Uh, then he would phrase it as the Holy Land. Uh, later in the 1860s, he was taking people to India. Um, and they were traveling actually in much the same way as Thomas Cole was traveling, where it was quite simple. It was quite bareback, it was not luxurious. Um, and what Cook would have would that every single stop sort of like leg of these trips, he had teams that were not hired by him, but rather through third parties who he knew he could count on to sort of sub in. And what um, Cole was probably experiencing was something a bit similar where with each stage coach and each sort of hired coach he was going with, they'd have their own sort of back inventory of people uh, who they can lo yeah. like pull yeah. in yeah. to help out with something. Um, but it is, I mean, it was, it was a fascinating industry. Global tourism was booming at this time. So this is, this is really where, where someone in the middle class could go on a trip for leisure for the first time in human history. Um, and so it's really fascinating that Cole was traveling parallel to that. It's also worth noting that when he traveled, you know, he went to Rome, but he stayed for months. You mm -hmm. know, he rents a studio, he starts painting there. Like, it's not that he's you know, kind of like on a cruise where he's got, you know, six hours, then he's got to get back on the boat. Like he's, mm -hmm. he's settling in these places for long periods of time um, to do his work. And so, you know, one explicit, like he, he developed relationships with local people who assisted him in whatever way. Yeah. He needed. Yeah. I mean, if you had to go all the way across the ocean and for weeks, you wouldn't want to turn around and go right back after the weekend. Um, I have another question here. Um, wouldn't Thomas Cole's traveling companions wait a minute the question just uh, vanished um, oh i can see it here yeah. when they help <laughs> others carry trunks was there a sense like in any caste system only certain people would carry trunks there definitely wasn't a caste yeah. system yeah. where like it was dirty to touch your own trunk yeah. um but there were a lot of people who could make money off of tourism yeah. and the more people that could be involved with carrying a trunk the more people could get tipped for carrying said trunk so sort of similar to when you go to um, a nice hotel now and they, a bellhop comes down, it's not because you can't carry your suitcase in the vast majority of situations. It's because there's someone who could benefit by making your life a little easier. The, in Italy, one might find a Cicerone, who was a person who would show you around and, and kind of make sure your bag was attended to and kind of ease, you, ease your travel in the hopes of a tip. You know, and that, that's very much the, the kind of so it, it's it's a much more opportunistic thing than um than you know a, 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 ca a rigid cast system yeah. yeah and i mean it's I, just to give another like little parallel a little bit later in time but you have the um great exhibition mm -hmm. in london and they had a great shortage of hotel rooms and housing and so like everyone in the city opened up their basements and would like hang hammocks in their basements. When, like if people, yeah. as tourism boomed, people got creative because it's they could- the like, old fashioned uh, Airbnb. <laughs> yes, yeah, but they could figure yeah. out how to make money from this. When, and and that, yeah. that was a big part of it. When the Treaty of Amiens was signed it, and it was the only truce between Napoleonic France and Britain. So this is a little earlier than Cole, but just to show an example, people were so strapped for hotel rooms in Paris that they tried to just occupy rooms in the Louvre <laughs> which was an art museum at that point. So they were just, they were like, Can, is it okay if we bring in a, a wood stove? And they're like, no, what are you doing? You are not living in this room. This is absolutely unacceptable. But it was just people were, were trying to, you know, they wanted to be there and they were traveling and they had no other so they were like, okay. So they're if I just burn this painting, like, no, what are you doing? It's beautifully decorated. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're great rooms. <laughs> they're not, not hotel not rooms. Not okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then there's, um, we've been looking at the letters, um, Thomas Cole luckily wrote a lot, um, and I wish that people had kept the letters that other people wrote. Um, huh. you know, so, right, like they they weren't kept, but at least from Thomas Cole's letters, he refers to people. Um, for example, there was a man named I think Martin who was referred to as Cole's man. So it was like the person who would have helped him carry the trunk. You know, like yeah. So yeah. we're we're just delving into the research and. Um, 
finding out all these other people and what they did. It's 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 great to pop repopulate the place, you know, with all these people. I feel like they've been, you know, hidden. It's like that metaphor you used about like the spotlight. Like there was just a light on Thomas Cole's forehead, and like that was the only thing we saw. And like if you brought it out, you're like, oh my gosh, look at all these other people. Um, yeah, so hundred percent. Yeah, it really just makes it makes the story so much more um, complex in a great way. Yeah. Um, so. Anyway, I think that's all the questions that we've got at the moment. So um, I want to thank you guys again and um, tell everybody that our next Sunday salon is Sunday, March 20th. And we're going to have this incredible guy um, whose name is Dr. Scott Manning Stevens. And he is this great combination of uh, an expert in 19th century art as well as indigenous studies. So his title is um, Professor and Director of Native American Studies at Syracuse University. And he's going to talk about, uh, here's his title, Indians in the Landscape, Painting Over Indigenous Sovereignty in the 19th Century. So we're really excited to hear him. That is Sunday, March 20th. And also something that um, Ben and Pippa said about Thomas Cole, like he died so young, you know, what would have come next? And that was a great lead in. Thank you. I didn't even have to prompt you for our exhibition that opens at the end of April where we're gonna answer that question. We're gonna bring back all the objects that were in Cole's studio when he died, which were kept there for a long time afterwards as kind of a shrine that people would visit. Um, and it really gives a sense of what he was about to do. Um, it's very seldom that his late works have been examined. So that will open on April 30th. So please mark your calendars and thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, and thank you to our team, uh, Heather Parabek and Heather Christensen for putting on this program and thank you all for joining. See you next time.